Steve Jameson, welcome to the show. Happy to talk about John Wooden with you. Well, you yeah, you've spent your career writing and working with John Wooden about and basically distilling his his leadership philosophy, his coaching philosophy. I'm curious for those who aren't familiar with him because he was you know a phenomenal coach, but some people might not be familiar with him. Give us a thumbnail sketch of his life and career and what made him such an exceptional leader and coach. Perhaps what sets him apart from every other coach is that record of national championships that he accumulated, 10 national championships in 12 years, seven of them in consecutive years. This is He's got five or six records that are, are preposterous. Seven national March Madness championships in a row is one of them, starting in 1967, 1968, 1969, 70, 71, 1972, and 1973. Every year, a March Madness national championship. 88 straight games in a row, all-time winning streak, Division One basketball, men's basketball. And the again, some of these things are almost get silly. He has the longest winning streak. He also has the third longest winning streak. 47 games. And in between, the University of San Francisco is in second place with uh, 60 straight games. So it's just one thing after another, including four perfect seasons. So that kind of separates him from the pack, <laughs> a resume that is uh, historic. And I'm curious, how did you connect with him? I mean, how do, and how has your life changed because of that relationship you built up with him? In, in retrospect, it's almost embarrassing because I was working on a magazine article that was uh, kind of exploring uh, what top coaches did in their management and their thinking that might apply in business. And John Wooden was nearby. I knew his record was pretty good, but uh, I, I wasn't in awe of him. This is, I'm not bragging about it. It was my own stupidity, but he was nearby and I, you know, he had won some championships and I contacted his publisher, got his phone number, called him up and he said, sure, I'd like to talk to you. Come on over. What's your name again? <laughs> So it was a very modest beginning. And from that, we did eight books, and uh, many of them were bestsellers. We did a book on leadership that was a Wall Street Journal bestseller and a PBS show called Wooden of Values, Victory, and Peace of Mind. But it started out just with his little interview. I spent three hours with him, went home, transcribed it, and read it. And everything that he said was just a gem of wisdom of leadership of practicality and i went back and eventually talked him into doing a book and the book led to another book etc and uh, but it was from a very modest beginning right uh, so let's dig into that philosophy um because what impresses me about john wooden is that unlike a lot of coaches that were what we think of as a good coach he didn't yell he wasn't rah rah Yet he was an effective leader. How did he lead quietly? How, what was he? What was his? How was he able to, to convey to his the people he was coaching what he wanted and get them to do that without getting in their face and without the typical, you know, rah rah stuff. I think part of it was the fact that as a leader, he had he, he had a command presence, and we did. I mentioned eight books together and. There's so much material in there, and people have asked me to sort of, well, distill it. And I would distill it for you in this way. He knew his stuff. As a leader, he was made of the right stuff, and his definition of success was was radical. And all of those things go to his command presence, his ability to lead in a quiet is maybe not the right word, but he certainly was not a screamer and a tantrum guy. It was a very firm hand he had on the controls. He knew his stuff because he had been an All-American at Purdue. He had been an All-State basketball player at Indiana High School, where he went to high school, Martinsville. And at college at Purdue, he had a great coach there. So he understood the mechanics of basketball and how to teach those mechanics. But it's that second part where his, as a leader, he was made of the right stuff. He was a man of integrity. He was a man whose word meant something. He was a man who did what he said. So people, his players particularly, when he said something, he meant it and they knew it. So he didn't have to jump up and down to get their attention and, and he didn't, but he had a very 
firm, maybe stern approach to practices and all the rest. It, it was a, a, when he talked, people listened. And then the third part of it was this, the, his definition of success was radical because he didn't mention winning as one of the components of being a success at the highest level. Uh, for him, success was all about effort, not about winning. In his world, winning was a byproduct or a, an after effect, a consequence of true success, which was making the effort 100% to do the best you're capable of doing. Okay, well, there's a lot to break down there. So let's go back to this, his idea of success. So it wasn't winning games, but he did that in spades, as you talked about in your in our introduction there. So, um, so it was effort. How did he determine what, I mean, what was the metric he used, whether a player had given 100% of his effort? What, did, what was he looking at? Well, first of all, I have to chuckle when you say metric, because in the 15 years I worked with him on a variety of projects, metric was never used. But I understand what you're saying, and 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 uh, he would too. His metric, if you want to apply it to him, was the quality of effort you put forth to bring forth your best. And in the context of teams, it would be bringing out your best in ways that serve the team. So how, how do you know if somebody is doing their best? You don't. And this is the, 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 the tough part of applying what he says, because you are the only one. He would say this. Your boss doesn't know if you're doing the best you can do. Your, your wife, your girlfriend, your dog, maybe your dog does, but you are the only person that can look in the mirror and say that you truly gave all you had to give. Well, that kind of leaves the responsibility up to the individual. And uh, if you're the kind of individual that's given to fooling yourself, then you're on a slippery slope. If you look in the mirror and you're honest with yourself and you can say, I've done everything I can do, whatever the context, basketball or business, to bring out my best, you have succeeded. You are a success. His definition of success, which uh, if you'll let me, I'll, I'll give you right now, is peace of mind. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort 100% to become the best you're capable of being. That's a long sentence. What he's saying is success is trying your best to be your best. And only you know if you've done that. So if you are fooling yourself, you're not going to achieve the results that you're after. He called those results, by the way, winning was, as I mentioned, it's a byproduct. Success is, is in the effort. If that effort produces winning, so be it. Sometimes you'll do your best and you'll lose. Right. Well, and you, I mean, I'm sure as he worked with his players, he, he gained a grasp of what their best effort was. And you highlight instances where they would win games and he'd be disappointed in their their effort. Right. I, but a good coach can understand what's going on in front of him and a lackadaisical effort during a game, for example. You can smell that. But when the dynasty was in the process of, of rolling, they would play teams that they would beat by 50 points, especially preseason. And he didn't look at that score necessarily as indicating they had won. The effort that he smelled, if I can use that word, on the court, what he was seeing, were they putting forth in his view the best they had, even though they might have been ahead by 30 points? That was his gauge, not the final score. The same thing was done when the game was close. The score was a was a uh, possible indicator uh, that his team had achieved uh, success in putting forth their best effort. But it wasn't always the case. I asked him one time, Coach, are, are you saying that you would rather have a team put forth their best effort and lose than give a second-rate effort and win? And he he kind of looked at me with disdain because we'd been working together for a while. And he said, haven't you been listening? My standard was effort. My standard was how hard you work to be your best. And if you do that and lose you have achieved success in my in my opinion. Well, I had set a trap for him. And I said, ah, can you give me an example where you lost a game of importance and you were happy that your team had achieved success as you defined it? 
and he pointed to a game, a semifinals national championship, 1962. Walt Hazard was on that team, one of the great players in college history and a great NBA player. And uh, they were playing the defending champion. Cincinnati came down the court. They were behind by two points with 30 seconds left. And uh, the team had just had a, a phenomenal season of cohesion and effort and preparation. They had achieved success, and they had played their hearts out in this game. And Walt Hazard was called for a foul, charging. The press later said it was a phantom foul. He hadn't charged. He had The referee saw something that wasn't there. They lost the game. Afterwards, John Wooden went into the locker room and, and told his team how proud he was of them and how they had succeeded at the highest level and that they should walk out of that locker room with their heads held high. And he suggested to me, there's an example of a game that had a lot of consequences. We would play in the national championship for the first time if we won. We lost. But that team, and then he, he had this wonderful way of showing his pleasure. He said, that team, my, oh, my, how proud I am of that team and what they did. That's the best example that I got from him of effort is more important than the final score. Effort is everything. So, so there, he had an, an immense control of his emotions. Like, wouldn't even said he he didn't like emotionalism. Was this something that he naturally he was just he naturally had the ability to control his emotions, or was this something he had developed throughout his life? He had to develop. He had a temper, and it was a hot temper. When he was a kid, he would occasionally end up in uh, fist fights. He talks about one he had with his brother that uh, he, his dad caught the two of them fighting and swearing and gave him a good whipping. In those days, he weren't sent to jail for uh, that kind of behavior. The dad taught him a lesson, though. Don't, don't let your temper get out of hand. Well, it took more than that. John Wooden, as a coach, occasionally early on would let that temper get out of hand. He was a coach at Dayton, Kentucky for two years when he was first coaching out of uh, Purdue University and got in a phil- physical altercation with a lineman on the football team, the Dayton, Kentucky Green Devils. The lineman uh, decided he was going to take a break during calisthenics and gave Coach Wooden a little sass. They had a physical altercation. So he had a temper that could flare up, but he recognized early in his coaching that it was getting in the way of performance and progress and that it was a hindrance. And he eventually compensated to the level where you describe him as quiet and I would describe him as very intensely controlled, but that temper did get under control. And I, at one point asked him how he did it. You know, maybe we've got some tips here for people who have anger management problems. And I said, how how did you get the temper under control? And he said, I just did. I said, well, you know, you can't just say you just did. What did you have some like steps or uh, some kind of guidelines or anything? No, I just did. I recognized it was getting in my way and I just, just got it under control. That was, that was as, as much as I could get from him as to how he did get control of that emotionalism. He was all for emotion, but when emotion tipped over and got out of control, emotionalism, he called it, that was when you had a problem because you were no longer in control. Performance requires control, and and when you're suddenly all wrought up and out of control, you're vulnerable. And he did not like being vulnerable as a coach or have his team in a similar situation where they're out of control with anger or jubilation, as he called it, the the exuberance of being ahead or or winning. He liked everything to be on a steady keel. Another defining feature of Wooden that I like about him is his collection of rules and maxims. And this, I guess, is this something he, he's developed all throughout his life? He was always collecting these things? Yes. He, uh, he was a learner throughout his life, just, I guess, by, by inclination, collected ideas on coaching from his coaches. He was a, a voracious reader. He majored in English at Purdue University and was an honor student, studied Shakespeare for a couple of quarters, and along the way began collecting these maxims or aphorisms that helped him in his own life or would help his team in his coaching. And can I give you a couple of them? Yeah, no, yeah, please. One that goes really to the heart of his thinking and his his own teaching and coaching as a basketball coach was don't mistake activity for achievement. 
And in basketball, it's a game of constant motion. You can fool yourself because there are the whistles are blowing and the feet are running and the balls are being thrown back and forth during practice. And is anything being accomplished? Don't mistake activity for achievement. I asked him once, boy, a long time ago, 18 years ago. I know the year count because in 2000, he was selected as the greatest coach of the 20th century by various publications. ESPN and Sports Illustrated said he's the greatest coach in American history. And so I saw him about two months after some of these awards were given. And I said, hey, congratulations. You're the coach of the century. Uh, How does it feel? And he said, it's ridiculous. There is no such thing as coach of the century. Uh, Well, I said, let me ask you this. A lot of people think you are that. Let me ask you to tell me what you think you were good at. You may not think you were the coach of the century, but you had to be great at something. What in your mind were you great at? And he thought for a second and said, I was perhaps as good at organization as anyone coaching in my era. Now, organization means every minute of a practice, for example, is planned. Every minute. He kept each minute, each three-minute, each five-minute segment on three-by-five cards that he would keep year to year. So he would reference from this year to the next year to the back five years. What would, what did we do in practice? Who did we do it with? Did it help? This organization made his practices like a Swiss watch. And it goes to his his saying, don't mistake activity for achievement. His activity was meticulously planned. So there is one that really, I think, goes to who he was and, and how he did things. But he had all kinds of them. He would tell his players the best way to improve your team is to improve yourself. Discipline yourself. We're talking about control, self-control on temper. Discipline yourself, and others won't have to. Wonderful, wonderful ideas. Time spent getting even would be better spent getting ahead. All of them, by the way, are listed uh, in the back of his best-selling first book, Wooden, A Lifetime of Observations on the Court and Off. One that I like a lot, he got from his dad, make each day a masterpiece. And he he was really good at that. He he made sure that each day had elements of, of great performance and improvement. Each day he tried to make his own masterpiece. He was something. Yeah, what I, what I love about these maxims is... They're so, I mean, some at first blush, they can be, they just appear very folksy and too simple. But the thing is, like, if you actually put them into practice, they work, which is, I think, the why he's so enduring and timeless. I do too. I think that uh, there was substance to what he was saying and, and how he was saying it and who he was. W- one writer many years ago said that the secret to John Wooden. And his coaching and teaching was his simplicity. And that's sort of what you're getting at. He, he was able to teach in ways that were easily comprehensible and the mechanics of basketball. He would break down, for example, what you're supposed to do when you're under the basket, anticipating a rebound, where your hands are, eyes, balance, feet, the bend in your knees. All of this he would break down, teach, put back together. And all of the elements when you, bring it down to the individual parts of it are rather easily understood. The same with the maxims that you're talking about. Don't mistake activity for achievement. Uh, Wonderful. One of the others that he had, he had uh, a list of ideas from his dad called the seven point creed, but in there are exhortations to be better and, and how to make your life a positive, productive life. Be true to yourself, which is a variation of something in Hamlet uh, that Polonius said to his son, Laertes. Be true to yourself. Help others. Make each day your masterpiece. Make friendship a fine art. There are seven altogether. But when you follow those admonitions, the seven-point creed that his dad offered him over the years, wow, you become an extraordinary person. And John Wooden was extraordinary. Yeah, in our family, we actually, we have a family meeting once a week. And so my seven-year-old and my four-year-old, every week, they, they recite, the, I guess, the John, he wouldn't, wouldn't call them the two-by-threes. So it's like, that his dad gave them. So two sets of threes. Never, 
Two sets of three. Yeah. Never lie, never steal, never cheat, never whine, never complain, don't make excuses. Mm-hmm. That's become for that beca- that's become a family tradition in our house. That's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. Well, what I've found in working, I had, you know, the, the, it was a privilege to work with John Wooden. But what I've found is so many people love what he said, love what he taught above basketball. In all of the books that we did, there were no tips specifically on basketball, no tips on how to shoot a free throw, no tips on basketball. It was how to bring out your best in the context of basketball. And as uh, he felt, those ideas that transcended basketball would help make his players better people. And that was really, I know it sounds maybe old fashioned or corny. That really was his goal. He wanted his players. They could use as you are with your children, use in their own lives to be better people. He was, he was a teacher. He never called himself a coach. Others did, but he felt that he was a, a teacher and his main objective as a teacher was to help others achieve their personal best. And as he would tell anyone who asked, if you do that, if you achieve your personal best, make the effort to do the best you're capable of doing, you're a success. So one thing that he spent his, I think his life working on was the pyramid of success. What was this? When did he start developing? What was his goal with this pyramid of success? He started working on the pyramid of success in 1933. And I'll back up one step. When he began teaching at Kentucky, in Dayton, Kentucky, he was upset that a youngster who worked hard in his English class and got a B would have the parents come into the class after school and complain that their son had failed or their daughter had failed and got a B and had done the best they could do. John Wooden was very, very unhappy with that. And he saw it most visibly in basketball where a son, someone's son wouldn't make the team or would be a sixth player, wouldn't score a lot of points and come and say, what's wrong with my kid, coach? What, what's wrong? He's, he's not measuring up. And John Wooden knew that in many instances, that youngster had done the best they could do and they were being judged a failure. So that's, that really, that was repugnant to him. And so he came up with his definition of success for them, a way of measuring themselves that went to absolute criteria of effort, how hard they worked to bring forth their best. And once he had done that, he realized that as a teacher and coach, you needed to show people how to do something. You couldn't just say, hey, shoot a free throw. You needed to show them how to do it, where the chances of success were the highest. This success, as he defined it, making the effort 100%. And he came up over a period of years with 15 qualities, personal characteristics that he viewed as fundamental to being the best you can be. He also, and this was very creative, used a pyramid and each block personified one of those qualities that he felt so important. Hard work, enthusiasm, friendship, cooperation, loyalty, self-control, alertness, on and on, skill, Team spirit, poise. There are 15 wonderful qualities that he viewed as the starting point for the kind of success that he was telling his students and anyone else who cared to listen were fundamental for success at the highest level. I've said to many people, John Wooden had a standard of success that was higher than winning. And that higher standard was the quality of the effort you put forth. And the pyramid of success was a a blueprint, a guidebook to how you could go about achieving success, making that total effort to de- to become the best you're capable of becoming. So I'm curious, you know, throughout his career, he coached a lot of big stars. One of the most famous ones was uh, the player that would go on to become Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And there's a lot of other stars throughout the, his career, but at the same time, he was able to maintain a team that was team focused. So how did he do that? How did he manage all these, you know, what could be possibly big egos? So they're all focused just on the team. Part of his skills, um, I might call it part of his genius, was to understand human nature and to work with individuals in ways that were positive. He understood that when 
Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's Louis Alcindor, when he joined the UCLA varsity in uh, the 1967 season, uh, that the hard part of the equation would not be coaching Kareem, but rather helping the rest of the players understand Kareem's role and Kareem's uniqueness and to keep the team in balance emotionally and mentally. He would, at press conferences after a game, everybody wanted to ask him questions about Louis Alcindor. And he would say, please, before before the before we uh, take any questions, I just want to point out. And then he would pick a player who didn't get a lot of attention and say that so and so, boy, that uh, you know that steal that he made just at the half, that really made a big difference in the whole game. He would shine a little of the spotlight on other players who didn't get it, knowing Kareem would get more than his share, obviously. And in practice, he would occasionally uh, lay it on a little hard with the superstar to show that they didn't get special treatment. He he understood he had to work very hard to keep the team in sync and working together because if it didn't, it would, it would break apart. You needed, he wanted that beautiful uh, team spirit that he talked about. And when he was a grade school basketball player in the little country school in Centerton where they played on a dirt court. Their coach, who was the, you know, not really the coach, he was the principal of the school, but they had a little basketball team. And his coach taught him that the star of the team is the team. Believe it or not, that he carried through from grade school all the way to his teachings as a coach in high school and then at Indiana State University for two years, Indiana State Teachers College, rather, and then UCLA. The star of the team is the team. And it's not Bill Walton, and it's not Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Even though the the celebrity they achieved, obviously they were the star of the team. But the, the greater concept is the idea that those superstars need the rest of the team for the team to win. And he had a little a little way of explaining it when he would meet with a team. And again, he tells his story in, in Wooden. He he would describe a, car, a a team as like a beautiful Grand Prix racing car, and that Grand Prix racing car might have a powerful engine, a spectacularly powerful engine. That would be someone like Louis Alcindor, but that engine needs a frame, and that frame of the car needs wheels, and the wheels need lug nuts. And he was saying that each of the players that he was talking to had a role. You might just be a lug nut. You might be the 12th player on the uh, team at the end of the bench. But you had a role to play. And if the lug nut comes off, the wheel comes off, and that powerful engine is is uh, dysfunctional. That would be how he would try and add all kinds of approaches to work on the self-image of the team, that we're not just backing up the superstar. We're in this together. And that was part of his magic. He had superstars. I mean, totally crazy big superstars with Louis Alcindor and uh, Bill Walton. There are other prominent players, but those, those two particularly, he worked very hard on making the rest of the players understand that the, that the, the team was the star of the whole process. So as we've been talking about, he had a phenomenal career, yet he, I don't know, stayed humble throughout all of it. How was he able to do that? Well, I uh, I think that uh, there were two things involved. One was his uh, basic nature. Some of us are gregarious and walk into a room and start shaking hands. He was an introvert by nature, and I think the other part of it was he was a very he was a man of faith, and uh, he read the Bible. I, he showed me one of his Bibles one time, and it was threadbare. He had read it so much over the decades. But there's so much in the Bible that goes to this being humble. Pride goes before the fall. Everyone who is arrogant of heart is an abomination. Those kinds of phrases stuck with him. They were meaningful to him. And I think it it went to his basic nature, which was he was humble. He was a modest man. He might have been a little bit shy, in fact. And uh, as the fame came about, and as the dynasty was underway, being created by him, he just never got caught up in it all. In fact, it was a distraction. The acclaim, the celebrity, all of it contributed to his 
retirement in 1975. He just, he got tired of the, the bubble that, that he was in. And, and there were other reasons. He had some health problems and his wife, who he loved more than anything, was having health problems. But he also just, the, the, the celebrity, the acclaim, the attention was all distasteful to him. So that kind of, all went to why he was the same at the beginning as he was at the end. It was uh, it was unbelievable when I met him. He had re- he had been retired for many years, and yet he was like your favorite uncle. You know, there was no sense of I'm meeting a big shot. I'm meeting a great legend in sports. He was just as friendly and down to earth as you could get. And everybody I have talked to, going back to his early days in Martinsville, the people that he knew and coached say the same thing. He was. At the end, just as he was in the beginning. Do you think uh, he would be just as successful today as a coach as he was back in the 60s? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. As I mentioned in the beginning, he won 10 national championships, seven of them in a row. Could he do that again? Well, in 1963, he had not won a national championship. His teams had never played in a national championship game. So at the end of that season, if you had said to anybody, sports writer or John Wooden, do you think you can win 10 national championships in the next 12 years? Everyone would think it was preposterous. What I'm saying is, if you'd ask somebody back then whether he could do it, the answer would be absolutely not. He did it. Could he do it again? Absolutely not. But who knows? I'll tell you this, good coaching is good coaching. He knew his basketball. He was a modern thinker. He was open to ideas. He was a man that people wanted to follow. They wanted to do what he said, the players. And that's a pretty effective formula then and now. So, you know, it's a good barroom conversation. Could he do the same as he did then? I don't know, but he'd be among the best coaches coaching today if he were still at it. Are there any wooden like coaches or leaders today that you you see? Well, uh, uh, this is a good question. I- I'll give you the one who always gets mentioned, and rightfully so, is Coach K. Coach Krzyzewski at Duke has won five national championships, has the same attitude towards his players, that the players' lives mean something in addition to what they mean as players. He cares about his guys. But John Wooden told those who asked about this, that there were many, there are many coaches, thousands of coaches out there like him. The reason that he gets the attention is because of that record. But when I say like him, I mean they have the same values. They teach the same good things. They are concerned about their players after they graduate and that they do graduate. At the high school level, most coaches and most of the sports, men's and women, they are in it because they see this coaching as a, a teaching mechanism to help kids. It's not just about winning games. That's a, obviously a big part of it. But it's about helping these student athletes become better people. And, the, and, I, and I believe the high schools and colleges are full of great coaches like that uh, today. It's when big money starts to get involved that things change. I'm curious, after all this work, you know, working with him for so long, what's been, what has been the big change in your own life, working with him, talking with him, and writing about him? This may sound uh, kind of silly, but one of the biggest things that I've come to see, he died 10 years ago, uh, 2008. Increasingly, I have come to comprehend how fortunate I was to have worked with him and to have gotten to know him and to become a friend. It was an absolute stroke of great fortune for me that it occurred because to, 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 to become a friend or a collaborator or a coworker assistant to uh, someone of his achievement and to see how he dealt with it and how he created it, it was simply a, a stroke of the greatest good fortune. And then along the way, you see how a man with, like him, uh, a man with his credentials, stays humble. He treats everyone the same. Whether you're the boss or a a busboy at a restaurant, you get the same good treatment. He was sincere. He never got caught up in materialism. He made $32,500 the last year he coached. That's what he was paid for the last five years of his coaching. He had an assistant coach who was coaching at Duke. It was was, um, uh, Denny Crum. 
at Louisville, who was making more than Coach Wooden while they were both coaching. He just didn't get caught up in material items and, and celebrity. It was all kind of unseemly to him. All that mattered was this teaching, teaching, teaching. And, and that's what mattered. Maybe that's why he was so good at it. Well, Steve, um, is there any place people can go to learn more about your work and Coach Wooden? Coach Wooden would be very happy if you were interested in learning a little more about what he did and what he taught. As I said, we did eight books. The one that really is popular and broad-based is this uh, book called Wooden, A Lifetime of Observations and Reflections. And then his book on leadership is called Wooden on Leadership. And that was a bestseller for the Wall Street Journal and, and it goes into leadership and, and his ideas on it. Both are great, great exposés. Exposés is the wrong <laughs> word. Both tell very full stories of what he did, how he did it, what he believed. They're great reading. He was great. Well, Steve Jamison, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Appreciate your taking some time to talk about Coach John Wooden. My guest today was Steve Jamison. He worked with Coach Wooden on several of his books. They're all available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. The Essential Wooden is out in paperback. It's fantastic. If you want a good overview of Wooden's philosophy on leadership, teaching, and coaching, pick it up. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores. Also, to find out more information about Coach Wooden, go to coachwooden.com. You can find the Pyramid of Success there. You can print off if you want. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash wooden, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.